What's up guys, Dylan with Skate Warehouse. We just rolled into Santa Cruz, California and we're here at NHS Distribution, home of Santa Cruz Skateboards, Creature Skateboards, Independent, Mob, just to name a few. Uh, we're gonna get a tour of the facility and the NHS Museum, so uh, let's go take a look around. first section of our NHS tour, we were led by Dave Friel through their manufacturing facility. We got an inside look into the screen printing process and we learned a lot of history along the way. So what we have here is this is the dark, this is the dark room where we cut all of our screens for NHS manufacturing. This right here is just a regular manual or a automated screen, sorry. When we cut screens we use a, a film, you use a photosynthesis material, you shoot it, the light shoots the material, the screen the material then bakes, then you spray out wherever the artwork was. So at that point you have the window where your ink would come through. A uh, piece of artwork would be simple, something like this. So again, the light would shoot. Anywhere that you see the art would actually not, light wouldn't penetrate through, then the water would solulate and wash it out. So then you'd have your window for screen printing. We've got these kind of machines. We've got metal plates with the polymer cliche on it, that's what this red material is. It is, simulates what you saw as far as on a silk screen. The other material, it's a photosynthesis material. The problem is, is you don't have a window. So what you have to do is you have to first do the artwork like you normally would with the solid. Then you have to come back and put a dot pattern. And in this situation, we put like a 360 dots per square inch on there. And what that does, is it turns it all into a dot pattern. So it's no longer a solid. What happens on a printing press is it's got dot gain. So by breaking it all down by dots and then bringing it over here, what this plate would do is it would pop on top of here. We'd slide it into here. And now the machine would move. We have cups like this. These cups hold the ink inside with a razor blade and magnets around it to keep it nice and firm. It's got this post, boom, it would stick down on it. So then your ink well would move back and forth. When your ink well moves out of the way, your dauber then becomes in front of it. When it picks it up, it gets a dot gain. So what I mean by that is all the little dots gain into one solid. So by the time it comes back and prints on the wheel, it's a solid form. So that's how we're recreating the mesh of a silk screen, but yet on a plate. It's pretty wild, right? This machine wasn't originally made for wheel printing. This is how they print golf balls and CDs and stuff like that. So it's all been custom made. This thing moves around. This is called a caray. Uh, we've done individual special jigs to print trucks on here as well. We've printed golf balls, we've printed baseballs, we've printed uh, mine scopes. Whatever we can do when we're trying to look for more money, these things can actually create more work in the environment if you were to go low. Here, yeah, here's how a wheel would pop on. Here is the actual graphic. So as you can see, it's a nice solid. The lines are all clean and solid. The orange is solid. But actually on the plate, again, it was a dot pattern. So it's all dot gain. Another one of the processes that you guys are gonna see is that we do a heat transfer process. It kind of took over a lot of the hand printed skateboarding, if you will. It's a little bit cost efficient when you do heat transferring. And it's also, you can manage your inventory better. So what I mean by that is, when you print by hand, you could be stuck printing 700 to 1,000 of a run because you got to go color to color to color to color. Whereas the heat transferring, you can order 1,000 heat transfers and just make 100 boards. Sell the boards, make another 100 boards and so that you can control it better. You're not stuck with a lemon, so to speak, or a, a slow moving board. You put 750 in inventory, that might be a year's worth of inventory and that's not really what we're looking for. So here is a heat transfer machine. This machine's cooling off right now, I'm sorry, he just finished his run, so we're kind of in the middle of it, but you can see right here, here's the roller. What you have is you have heating elements around it. The transfers roll through on a plastic carrier. So what I mean by that is that the ink is on this plastic material, but it's actually held by like a dyne level. You see how my hair static? 
The dyne level on here is, is a static measurement. It's usually around 12. And what it does is it doesn't allow the ink to stick to the plastic, so it's floating. The, the plastic is just a carrier to get it here. Also, the plastic allows you to print on flat stock presses. So the clarity of a heat transfer is way more uh, tangible at that point because you don't have to print with the bends of the skateboard and with the contour to where it gives the chance for all these little lines to blend and bleed and move around. So you print it on a flat stock press, you have it in a lineup of three, they cut them, bring them here. We would heat transfer them as need be. The ink ends up on the board, but the plastic is thrown away. People seem to think for some reason that when they see a heat transfer, they think we're putting plastic on skateboards. It's super important for people to know that it's just another way of applying ink to a skateboard. There's only ink on this board. The thing that makes it successful, other than the temperature and the roller, is that the white ink at the end of this transfer has glue in it. That is a heat sensitive glue. So this glue reacts to the finish of the skateboard. They emboss together. The plastic peels off and gets thrown away. You clean the edges and you have a perfect skateboard. We can make about 70 an hour off of this thing, finished. So when we're talking about heat transferring, you can see the simplicity and it's a one operator system and they can roll the boards. This is what in the 80s and 90s was developed and what we had to tolerate when we were printing by hand. You can imagine all the time that went into inventing these. When I first discovered this, and this still registers really well, the screens are very tight. Um, we didn't let anybody see these for like 10 years. We didn't want anybody to know about these screens. We didn't want them to know about the technology. We didn't want them to see what could actually be done to help printing that much clearer. So when you see all the bitching stuff at the beginning of the 90s as well, this is, it was all done on these bent frames. We went through a small stage where the tables were actually hydraulic instead. So what I mean by that is this right here is a jig for a skateboard to go on. And what we originally thought, because we originally had flat screens, is that we would just have the jig drop. So I would hit an air pedal with my foot, the screen would drop down. That's why there's a window right here because the shock used to pull down right there and the tail would be mounted up a little higher on a bearing. And then it would, this screen would be flat and as I would screen, my foot would come off and the nose would come up. What happened there was the graphic grew a quarter of an inch because the board slides when it comes up, we're actually making the graphic longer than it originally is. So Jimmy had to go back to the drawing board and make the graphics smaller. So then when I printed them, they would grow bigger. So now you can imagine the, the stress on registration got really crazy. In the late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot of blemishes and imperfections and stuff, but people just kind of rode with it, it was okay. For me, it's as simple as three colors or less here is as affordable as doing a five, six color heat transfer. So we'll try and fight to keep the hand printed stuff around two and three color decks and we'll do them at home just fine with one guy doing all the colors. As opposed to when we get into some difficult stuff, we'll just go to the heat transfer and they kind of weigh each other out. This table itself, I made this table in like 1985. It's printed well over three million skateboards. Like when you see these ink colors over here, this is all inks from like Grosso's, Roscops, everything from back in the day. Uh, this table's been through all three journeys and what I mean by that is by the original first hand screens to the hydraulic screens now to a bent frame. The most important thing that happens in screen printing is off contact. It's very important when you're screening something that as you screen the screen is lifting up behind the squeegee so that it would not make a blemish. In which case if you were to be screening like this the screen would be lifting up a tiny bit behind you and at that point you could see how important it is for the, the screen to actually follow the skateboard and stay within a quarter of an inch of itself to make it as clear as you possibly could. Now, the other difficulty comes when people are screen printing and if they lean over here, if they lean over here, it actually changes the mesh, the registration. So when you have multiple guys working together, I could be screening one way and then the next guy could be screening a little pushing on his left arm, be a little sore or something, and his registration is going to go off. So sometimes people ask, well, if you're going to do a two and three color 
skateboard by hand, why don't you have two or three guys do it together? It's easier for this one guy because he'll pull the same and then the next color he'll pull the same again. So at that point his registration has a better chance of being perfect. Also, one of the nicest things about printing by hand now is that everything is water-based. So back in the 80s and the early 90s, we were getting really high, a lot of lacquer fumes, things coming in and out of heaters all the time, steam coming off of these boards. You wouldn't believe it. It's like you could see yourself running around on the screen. You're so loaded sometimes. You know, you have to almost go to lunch and get drunk to be normal again, you know, go to have a pizza and a pitcher of beer, come back to work, and you're sane again for at least a half hour, and then fumes get back after you and you're done. But with the water-based ink, you never smell anything. It doesn't do anything. It's water-soluble. We water wash up, clean up. We don't need lacquer thinner. We don't need anything. So that's like the greatest thing about it. On the other side of it, when you do heat transfers, you're using UV ink. And UV ink's dry by a lamp. So it's going incredibly fast on, a, on an automated press. It's just being printed, then it's going through a lamp, and then it's being printed and going. So UV ink works really well for that and for the speed, accuracy, and also, it's a really good slipper. You know, the, the ink is, UV ink is really slippery. One of the things that I think people misunderstand is that the thickness of ink, when you use UV inks, you can print like the thickness of your hair. So five colors on a heat transfer could feel like one or two colors by hand. So there's where you get that imperfectionness or some skaters will say a hand printed board slides way better. Well, it's because it's got like two heat transfers thickness on it instead of one. So, and again, this is all made in house. Um, these frames were made at the skateboard shop, the factory itself in Wisconsin, and then brought out here, and then I stretched them here. So, it's all private, personal stuff, total custom made.